phone. Um, it's just uh, recently uh, that I, I, I said, you know, having this feeling that this, this long name is not important anymore. Because I remember, uh, I think it was in 2017, summer, I was going to perform, play a recital. So, so the lady that was uh, to introduce me on stage came and said, how do you say your first name? And I said, HS on a chuku. <laughs> she said, can I say E? To which I replied, no. <laughs> you have to let, and she did. Um, I know that uh, in the next uh, few years, I'm going to be a professor here in the United States, and I suspect that the first task I'll have, my first lesson will be to teach my students how to say my name. <laughs> and uh, the, the progress of that class will depend on the success of that teaching. <laughs> so you don't want to have a professor whose name you can't say. Um, the title of my book is Chrysanthemum is for Why That Goes. There has to be something with long, you know, long words and long words. <laughs> it's okay. After this time, maybe we'll stop. Other books will have something short. Um, I'll read from my collection tonight, but before then, I would like to read two poems by contemporary French poets whose work I find really fascinating. I'll be reading the work of Jonathan Moyer and, of course, um, Maria Barros. The first is titled the Parisian chimney sweep knows the night. They are ash, they are soot, they are silhouettes against the Paris sky. The chimney sweeps of Paris dated themselves into a clean extinction. Coal, fire, and wood are easy to digitalize in a fireplace generating no warmth, embers and smoke that blackens brick. Gin fell off the roof and was turned into cinders three days later. The rest showed up just to smoke and drop cigarette ash on his grave. A blackened trip until they sing their brushes over their shoulders, head down, walking fast to sweep the next silo, knowing eventually there will be none. The old pros need oxygen machines to help them breathe. The young face their extinction with the indifference of those who stutter into the next position. Their black calling leaves them on faith to the verges of weather and even death. This is no longer the job of orphans and poor young boys. Although a few reckless young justice will break dance on a rooftop. Only the wealthy, the old, and the curators know the evidence. They do, because the greatness of Paris is viewed from its rooftops. And that life at best is a black and white photo. Mm -hmm. That's a poem by Jonathan Moore. I'll read another one by Linda Maria Barros. It's titled, Mind Horse. <laughs> the house that nursed you told you perhaps at night the story of mind horses. Mind horses are born and live in the depths. Between gallery walls, one finds their house, their table. They are they feed on enormous species of darkness of coal. They feed themselves gropingly by lamplight, and like gallery slaves, they blindly pull coal trucks they carry always and forever, as long as a horse's life lasts. They carry life to the surface, but at the surface, in light, they cannot live, not even when they are retired. Released from the mind, because they come into the world blindfolded, darkness glued to their foreheads. And like these, they live a little longer, daughter, 
breezes and fragrances make them shiver in the crumbling coal shed, in the courtyard of the mine, blindfold until they descend once more into the depths. Their house is the eternal. Thank you. So now, um, I'll be reading a few poems from my collection, Chrysanthemums for Wide Eye Posts. In the collection, there are, the, the poems are divided into seven sections, and each section has a particular theme. And because, of course, one will talk about you know, Paris. We talk about love, we talk about life, we talk about relationship, we talk, we talk about beauty and a lot of you know beautiful things of life. Um, I'd like to read first of all the introductory, uh, the opening poem, uh, which I call the initiation. After which I'll read uh, maybe two love poems, and then read poems about music, and of course about grief, absence, and death. The first poem is titled, The Initiation. Entry. With your hands in your pockets, you walked into the room and lights went up. You've come on your own accord. Your voice roared and doors locked behind you. On your knees, another voice called. You knelt and closed your eyes as Mozart's requiem in D minor field rose. Ah, those rules read to your hearing, knocked off the air you once breathed. The tales that taught you magic, the ones you dreamt to use of, the taste of wines that built your bonds. That night, you drank a new wine served in a score with sauce. A new bond was born. Each vow was sealed with a thumbpin in a basket of thumb papers and spilled ink. Exit, lights on. You opened your eyes and the requiem resumed. Nothing remains the same. In the midst of those who formed that arc, your new self came on a tray of books and pens. You became a slave to every living world. When you left the room, tails hung over your head and followed you everywhere. You must be a man. That is uh, initiation. To be a writer or an, or an artist, basically, it requires the effort of community. If you're a writer, you have to be taught. You need input. You need a community to to make your to give your art that. Um, the best form that you need. That's why we have writers, workshops, conferences, and all of that. So sometimes it's a process, and it affects all, all, the, all other areas of life. You know, so you have to go through some form of tutelage to become the final product, um, in a sense. So I'll read a love poem. The first is titled, Flame. Strumming chords and wiping tears on New Year's Eve, I was left to wonder if heartbreak is a long-awaited prophecy or the eleventh commandment. I sang the first hymn and watched you close your eyes, shaking your head like you would if I were a sauce sad cold on a Sunday noon. I am not the mathematician who loves to find X when his whiskey is waiting, cubes melting in yellow. I have been your intoxicant. Associate professor of whiskey and wine, I drink and pour myself another until I'm a river. This is how stories travel me. Sit me, if you please, but slowly. Do you remember the spark in our first kiss? I know how fire burns with water. We made it happen on Lover's Day after we left the note at the door of saying, busy right now, come back later. So no one knocked on. There is no song greater than the fire that burns on what tickling tongues and tendons, eternal fire and flame. We stood on the flames to peek into heaven, 
to ask a new angel at the gates of light, if angels sing Garam B or Rap, if Jesus owned a Baroque trumpet or classical guitar, if X Q is served on arrival. To search your eyes is to play a game of numbers, counting backwards and asking God to raise the dead again. Lazarus was his friend, but so are we, breathless, hoping to hear a voice when we drink. This poem is titled uh, The Blind Pianist. There is a blind pianist who plays all night in my street, Sony Bar. His coat smells of tobacco and history. Black is the color of the tunes that announce his blindness. He attracts pity and little conch too. Some nights are cruel to him, while some share a bottle of beer or two. This night, his hoarse voice brings a release, lost love alive. There is love in every lost melody, every lost dream, every lost smile, every lost handshake and lost waves. Kindness hides in his voice and in the movement of his fingers on the keys. There is a touch that can strum any lady's guitar. This night, blindness lost its grip over romance, over music, over beauty, over attraction that hides behind the walls of soulful song. This night, love, music, and good are telepathic language. Thank you. Um, sister's song. Sister sings of a love she hopes to have at the end. This morning, her voice rings out as she washes away last night's nightmares. In the shower, she sings better than Beyonce. <laughs> she is yet to drink her love facing cameraman and a voice saying, tape rolling, three, two, one, action. Her love is in her womb, tapping at the wall which bears this song that kills my father. Bed poems and love poems are sweet communion, she said. Monday mornings are sad poems, I say. Don't sing again. <laughs> okay, um, the title of this book, Chrysanthemums for Why That Book, is uh, taken from a poem in the collection. So there is a poem in the collection titled Chrysanthemums for Why That Book, and I would like to read that poem. Chrysanthemums for wide-eyed ghosts. <coughs> what I've not told you is that the man in black is the new west funeral home in town. He was christened only yesterday before his sons shot themselves after seeing a movie about ghosts playing from bones. I learned to say farewell in dialects spoken by exchanging chrysanthemums and listening to these in the strong. We are here, heads bowed, bowing to lock our guns when ghosts start sinking on teeth. <laughs> so in Mays London, I live, um, you know, there is actually, um, I don't know how many of you know the St. Vincent de Paul, the cemetery. If you know St. Vincent de Paul, it's yeah. a, a very old Catholic church in Mays London. And of course, most churches or churches like that have cemeteries. So I wrote a poem titled, Living Near St. Vincent the Paul Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Living Near St. Vincent the Paul Cemetery. Living Near St. Vincent the Paul Cemetery is hearing your thoughts echoed by ghosts, looking in the mirror and seeing a face you once knew, hearing a church bell and thinking, about all the ghosts you could report to God. There are cops here, but they don't arrest ghosts. And there is a white mansion where ghosts prayed and party all night in silence, windows knocking against themselves when their DJ plays a bad turn. Living near St. Vincent de Paul Cemetery is learning to say that ghost, fear, and solitude in five languages. Silence is the legal tender which they pay their debts and sell up sad memories. 
There are too many lovers here whose kisses have become sand and foam. I look at weights and I am reminded of death's beauty. But I am afraid of this beauty, even though I be told it is inevitable. Living near St. Vincent de Paul Cemetery is learning to pay attention to spirit sound, being aware that their conductor can smack your head and learning to not leave the hole in the middle of the performance. Rap music is for the living, but concertos and canticles are for cemetery citizens who maintain the road that leads to heaven. I have learned to walk out of my dreams when strangers intrude to recount how they dance means they are still on earth, how fashion is stained, how love is underrated, how maggots are everyone's enemies, how lies can be misleading, how humanity is an unending war and how red wines breed bold love. There are no seasons in the cemetery, but ghosts on our way. I have learned that New Jersey's cold respects no man, dead or alive. Living near St. Vincent the Paul Cemetery is to see how replacing an old grave could be a song that heals broken hearts. Broken hearts visit this place and live with more tender emotions. A certain ghost who visits my dream in colorless shoes once told me how death can be liberating. For when I told him I would rather be in chains as human, I woke up in sweat to sounds of gunshots, sirens, and people running with their lives in their hands. Living near St. Vincent the Paul Cemetery is being neighbors with a team of magicians and alchemists who enchant you, letting you decipher how an image can quickly turn to nothing. There are nights when moans keep the darkness company, sounding like piano accompaniments to a soprano solo, or ringing subtly like Santa's tiny bell on a Christmas morning, and you wonder if ghosts have sex too. There are nights when night itself gets tired of our issues, waiting for daybreak like hops surrounding the lodge of a crime suspect. I have learned to observe dogs when they're back at night. Sometimes they look back at you to add your voice, but humans who talk to nothing are taken to psychiatrists as patients or regarded as geniuses. To be a genius is to learn how to talk to ghosts or to be a ghost in disguise. Dead poets whose epitaphs are poorly written knock on doors at 2 a.m., whistling a hymn about Christ's resurrection. Living near St. Vincent the Paul Cemetery is reading poems by Pablo Neruda and imagining the poet as a presidential candidate in a nation where skeletons think, I do too much and that love poems on dreams. There is only one way to upset a stranded ghost. Whistle back when you hear a whistle at night. There are two ways to upset all ghosts. Walk into the cemetery with a bottle of brandy. <laughs> Read a bad poem at any gravesite in the cemetery. Thank <laughs> you.